Spread the fire, welcome back to SMWX. And in today's episode, I'm extremely excited to be in conversation with Andrew Harding, who's BBC Africa con correspondent. He's the author of The Mayor of Mogadishu and this very exciting, interesting, and incisive book called These Are Not Gentle People, which was published in 2020. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us on SMWX. Thank you for having me, Siswe. It's a great honor. So this is um, a really hmm, interesting work in, in the, just the sheer range of themes on which it, it touches. But before we dive into some of those themes, I wondered if you could just summarize for our audience the, the events in 2016 which led you to write this book and around which this work revolves. So in January, January the 6th, 2016, uh, a group of white farmers responded to a, one of those alarm messages, a WhatsApp group message, uh, that there had been a farm attack uh, in the, uh, on an elderly white farmer uh, not far from Paris in the Free State. And they responded, they came rushing, about 40 or 50 people, fathers and sons, and they cornered two black men uh, at the edge of a field just before sunset, uh, pretty quickly. Um, and some of those men then proceeded to beat the two arrested men. They'd essentially detained the two men without a fight, uh, but they then proceeded to beat them, interned, over a period of some hours. The police finally arrived um, and the two men were taken away in the back of a police truck uh, to Paris Hospital. One of them was considered so badly injured that he was taken a little later to Bloemfontein, to a hospital there. The other um, was actually misdiagnosed appallingly. Um, and both men were pronounced dead the following morning. Um, it was about, two or three weeks later that I started following the case um, more closely. And I went down to the magistrate's court in Paris, I think it was February or March. And I was looking for a project, if you like a book. I was, I just finished writing the first book you mentioned, The Mayor of Mogadishu, a, a story a, about a, a man in Somalia, Britain, Somalia. But I, I had a bit of time free before I had to resume my BBC duties. And I was looking for a, something, I wanted, to, I was looking for a crime story that could perhaps delve into some truths about South Africa. And I wanted to write it as a novel. I knew that very much from the start, but I wanted to write something in the, you know, I was aspiring towards something like Truman Capote and In Cold Blood, one of those true stories, but that you're not really sure when you're reading it, whether it's a novel or the truth or somewhere in between. Um, and I, sat in the back of this magistrate's court and I was immediately drawn into the drama of a group of ones who'd been arrested very quickly and charged with murder very quickly um, by uh, the Hawks who'd arrived in town. There was a lot of political pressure on the Hawks, it seemed, um, to find the culprits in the case. And there were uh, very quickly, the usual demonstrations that we've seen in other cases of this kind outside, white farmers, mostly from out of town, um, people with a more of a political axe to grind, talking about white genocide, and against them across the barbed wire that the police had set up, you had both the ANC and the EFF um, with their supporters um, also pressing for justice in the case. And the magistrate in the court a very outspoken Indian woman called Leshni Pillay very quickly gave the impression to me that she was under huge political pressure from the ANC, and was very angry about that. She felt the case was being rushed. She felt that she was being pressured. And I got the sense of this potentially fascinating story. And so I decided to kind of attach myself to it and not to write anything for the BBC or for newspapers or anything, but to promise everybody that I encountered that I was there for the long game. 
that I wanted to earn their trust and to try and tell this story that I, I knew was complicated, but I had no idea quite how complicated and quite how many twists and mm. turns there would be, that I wanted to tell it from all perspectives. And, and that's what I did. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, quite, I don't know if it's surprising or not surprising anymore that the deaths of Samuel Chitla and Simon Jubeda um, barely featured really in the mainstream political discourse, despite what seemed to be a torturous, potentially racially, well, certainly some of it racially motivated attack. And what struck me about the the story as a whole is that it encompassed so much of the old, but also reflected a lot of the new. And I wondered from your perspective, because I've heard in previous interviews you, you suggesting that you thought this was an interesting microcosm for South African society as a whole. Um, what do you think this story is a microcosm of um, in, its, in its different features and facets? When I was beginning to get interested in the story and considering it as a possible subject for a book, I was quite wary because I, 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 I've, I know these farm stories and I know how they tend to drag people to the extremes, to the fringes, um, of politics here and, and of reality here in some ways. And I didn't want to get dragged to that kind of shouting match um, style of story. I wanted something that felt more real, more honest. But the truth is that, you know, this is a case through which there is a very thick line of modern day racism. And you mentioned there, you know, uh, Chika and Jubeba, these two men who's identities right from the start and the whole way through the judicial process. Their identities were ignored, they were erased, they were confused. And that very quickly got me quite shocked and then increasingly angered. And that was one of, I think, the motivations for me to stick with it. And, you know, as much as living in Rosebank and, you know, taking my share of this, you know, of what's going right here in South Africa, um, over this past decade that I've lived here or more, um, it's very clear to me as well that a lot isn't going right and that increasingly South Africans are, younger South Africans are looking to reevaluate as they have every right to do, you know, the realities of, of the past three decades. Um, and I felt that this story allowed me to look, not in a political way so much, but in a very much in a human community way and the individual stories of these people and how out on the farms the races live apart and they struggle to engage and when they do engage there is so much mistrust um, and the institutions that should be helping to bridge these gaps in a case like this I mean obviously a murder case is an extreme event but it's a re revealing event in that, uh, because of that. And every single institution enabled Simon and Samuel's identities to be forgotten or ignored or deliberately confused. And every single institution that should have somehow stood up for their dignity, the dignity of their families, um, betrayed them. And I wanted to tell that story, but I also wanted to make it clear what it looked like for those white farmers who were also in their bubble. And although some of them, in my view, are, are clearly, um, you know, people who've behaved with appalling violence um, and who are clearly show racism, there are also people in that community who I think are, are desperately lost and reaching out and trying to find a way to make things work in a community where it's so difficult to reach across those boundaries. I think uh, one thing that that comes through is a broader frustration that, that I certainly feel, which is on the one hand, the story shows the 
monstrous racial inequities that still persist and, and the racial violence that still persists. But on the other hand, it also shows the, the, in, the state's incapacity to grapple with, with these inequities, which seems to be such a, such a frustrating feature of where it feels like South Africa is now. It, it, it feels as though in 1994, uh, what we won was the ability for the state to bungle a case. Um, and it's that frustration that I think the, the work captures um, so uniquely is, is the, the, the historical violence, but the present incapacities and injustices which lie on top of those historical currents. Because if, if you stand back from the story there in Paris, you could argue, well, the courts work. It took a long time, but they got a verdict. You may not agree with the verdict, but there were experts who turned up, um, highly competent in some cases, less so, I would argue, in others. <laughs> right. uh, there was a medical system that looked after these men. An ambulance went out to greet them halfway. It wasn't perfect. There were some mixed diagnoses, but broadly speaking, you know, you can say the system works here, and it's true in so many ways in South Africa. This is a functioning country um, on so many levels. And yet, when you get a stress point um, and you dig a little deeper, and I suppose this is where the, the, sort of the idea of a microcosm comes from, and a town like Paris is to me quite a sophisticated place. It's got its tourism. It's close to Joburg. It's got a complex and in many ways quite successful um, thing going. You know, mm. it's, it's a nice town in some ways. Um, and yet you, you poke at these issues and these institutions and they just seem to be skin deep, to be very fragile. Mm. Mm. And um, in addition to um some of some, well, there are many institutions at play here, both formal and informal. But one of the institutions is is the is the criminal justice system, and what we what we get is an up close rendering of of how that system works and doesn't work. What was it like being in that courtroom, and what insights did you gain on the broader criminal justice system by following this particular story? Um, so closely? Well, I mean, the, the, the most obvious thing is, is the languid pace of it all. There is mm. no sense of earnest sen uh, focus on speed. And I, and I appreciate that the justice system works in its own way and it's okay for it to be slow to some extent. But for instance, this morning I was woken up by a, a text message um, and then a call from Ruth um, Kokota, who's the mother of Samuel Chicha, one of the dead men. Mm. Uh, I stay in touch with her, um, having got to know her quite well over these last four or five years. Uh, and she was, she just heard that sentencing was supposed to take place today in Paris. Um, I found out that it wasn't going to take place, that actually um, the prosecution um, has asked for another adjournment because they still, this is two years after the end of the trial, uh, nearly two years after, a, a full year since the summary judgment by the judge, they still haven't been sentenced. The men involved, the accused, have not been sentenced. And so for all the people involved, for the guilty men, for their families, but above all, for people like Ruth and the other relatives of the two dead men, they can't move on with their lives. And this is against the rules of, of the court process here. You're supposed to have a full judgment within three months. And yet this a creaking pace uh, makes you wonder, why is there no pressure? And I suppose part of that is, is that, and this is a problem globally, there aren't enough local journalists and enough good local media following cases like this, a case that very quickly slipped away from the headlines to be replaced by the next drama, the next sensation. There aren't enough journalists focusing on these cases to keep public attention. 
on them and to, and to you know, keep pressure on the judiciary to do its job. Um, mm. and one thing I've been really struck by, um, just getting to know people in Tumahole, the township um, of, of Pades, um, is how little people know about what's going on in this case and the absolute hunger for knowledge. When you go and you start talking to people, I remember just talking to some ambulance drivers outside the hospital uh, a year or so back, and mm. people were desperate to know what was happening. They hear rumors, but no one's got the time to keep focusing day in, month in, year in on this case because it keeps getting delayed and it takes so long. But there, there's just this hunger to know what's gone wrong, what's happened. And yet, how can a, how can a community function when it doesn't know what's going on in a case as important to the community as this? And the Paris Gazette, the local paper covered it, but it's not delivered in Tumahole. Um, the local community radio station sort of covered it in Tumahole, but then it wasn't there for the, for the verdicts. So mm. um, I think enormous gaps in all those stepping stones that where, where information and power should be bringing a community together and it's just not working. Yeah, it, it, it somehow encapsulates a lot of, of the political moment. I remember, for example, in the 1990s, there were similar sensational stories or sensational events which did capture the imagination of, of the nation and were followed. And it's almost as though a sense of fatigue has developed around these sensational events. And we, we can't confront them anymore in the same way as we used to, um, almost as if a kind of uh, denialism, I don't know, either it's nihilism or denialism has set in. Well, for instance, Cizwe, in the court itself, um, the fact that Simon and Samuel's identities were confused, you'd understand that the defense would want to do that. Why should they help the prosecution? The fact mm. that it's very difficult to work out who hit who, which injury can be connected to which action, that's all very useful for, for the defense. So it's understandable when they don't make any attempt to really explain that. But the prosecution seemed two black prosecutors, senior black prosecutors, seemed to kind of lean into that same mood, that sense of whatever it was. They never made a proper attempt either to explain who did what to whom. There was no proper timeline. There was no proper clarity. They relied, and I don't think it's necessarily a, the wrong move, although if you read the book and the podcast, you may, you may come up with different conclusions. But, I, you know, they relied on common purpose. The idea, well, there was a group of men. They beat these two guys. The two guys died. Need we say more? So that was, a, I suppose, a legitimate legal argument. And yet they should have done the hard work to prove who did exactly what. And, and I, I felt they failed there. Uh, and I never, I never quite understood why they didn't do more. So, Andrew, on the channel, we have uh, various aspiring writers. Um, and I think this is also work with artistic ambitions in addition to journalistic ones. Um, and so I'd like to talk to you about style in the postscript you mention the approach you've taken and you briefly alluded to it earlier you've you've written what you've called a work of, of narrative nonfiction, so that it reads very similarly to a novel but is also grounded in true events um, take us through the stylistic choice to do that and then can you also go into some of the stylistic choices in your own writing you write in very short sentences, quite vivid sentences. Um, what, were, what, what lay behind the, the broader stylistic choice and some of your more detailed stylistic choices? Well, the first thing is I wanted to write a thriller. I wanted to do justice to the drama in this story. And so I did not want to go off on long 
explanatory notes about the criminal justice system. I didn't want to kind of let down this, the urgency of the story. And also I wanted to, inter, inter, to interest the common reader. I didn't want this to be a book for people who are preoccupied with certain aspects of South African justice or criminality or farm murders or whatever. I wanted this to be a book that would appeal and sell, <laughs> um, hopefully, to the general reader and to an international audience who might not have heard about South Africa and South Africa's current troubles, but who just wanted a damn good read uh, and who likes nonfiction crime. Um, so there was that. Mm. There was also, I think, from early on, a stylistic choice I took in the research, which was firstly to record everything, to conduct very, very long interviews, um, taped interviews, overwhelmingly, um, in which I just tried to get people to explain what was going through their heads. And then to use all those different perspectives to recreate scenes as if I weren't there. So mm -hmm. for instance, when Ruth Kokota, mother of Samuel, one of the dead men learns that her son has been killed. It's a very tense and complicated moment. I spoke to her, I spoke to the two farm, white farmers who were there and who told her. And I tried to recreate the scene, not as a, as if I'm a journalist going, well, she told me this happened, then they told me this happened. But for me, and I wanted this from the start to basically withdraw myself entirely from the process um, as a voice. Um, I wanted also, and I explained this as you say in the postscript, um, to play a little bit with how I use those interviews. So what I've done, and actually this was very much helped by my editor, Alison Lowry. Um, we decided not to put most quotes in quotation marks. Mm. Um, instead, we wanted it to be obvious when you read it, you know when somebody's speaking, but there's a mixture of quotes that people, that I heard in court people saying, there are quotes that people said to me when they were recreating conversations they'd had with others. Then there are things that people just said to me describing a situation and what they were thinking. And then when I was writing the book, if people said to me, well, this was what I was thinking, I wouldn't say that in the book. I would say as she drove through this part of town, she was thinking this. Mm. My point being to try to, again, make the reader really feel that they're in the middle of this, that it's not a journalistic current events book, but it's a novel, but also in a way that when any of those people I interviewed would go back to the book, that they would say, well, this is true. This is what I was thinking. Um, Andrew has been honest with the account I gave him. Of course, it may be utterly um, contradicted, by other people, but my version is my version. And I think hopefully, my hope is that I've captured what they were feeling and their point of view and their perspective. And mm. because the crime itself at the heart of the book is so convoluted and so tense and is the source of so much of the friction in the book as this white farming community tears itself apart, trying to work out who should take responsibility for these two men's deaths. I went back to it again and again from all those different perspectives and each time, and it's, I hope, a sort of cinematic thing, that each time you see the crime anew from somebody else's perspective. Mm. It's interesting because you've mentioned now, but also in the book, that you get this feeling of moving between the real and the and the fantastical the crime itself is so fantastical that you almost can't believe it's true and that something like this could have happened and yet you know that it has been reported it, it is in the world so you you kind of are aware you're reading nonfiction, but feel like you know this could there's an imagine there's an imaginative aspect to it as well even though it's true so you're definitely playing interestingly with the boundaries of, of truth and and fiction. Um, and, and what I and yeah. what I've done as well, is, sorry, 
So um, what I did as well, Cizwe, is to try not to be judgmental in it. So there is no, I mean, the, these are, we're dealing with some very appallingly raw violence and the aftershocks of that violence, of suicide attempts, of marriages breaking down, and of this appalling gender-based violence that seems to infect almost every family, every portion mm. of the community um, in there. I wanted to let those facts and those opinions speak for themselves. Um, and that was partly um, because I thought it would make for a stronger book, but it was also, I think, something I, I've learned from my shorter TV and radio work, just as a consumer of news, that I'm much, I find it much more powerful when there is restraint um, from a journalist, when people are allowed to speak for themselves, and when you underplay emotion and drama. Um, and that's just a personal take. There are a lot of very good journalists who I think are far more emotive, who feel that you know you need to make the audience feel more angry. As a consumer, I, I just disagree with that. I, I prefer the restraint, the sort of British irony, if you like, that sense of detachment. I find that much more moving. And that's another technique that I, I really tried to bring to bear in the book, even if I hope a reader at the end will not be mistaken about where I'm coming from in terms of you know what I think of, of how this played out. But I didn't want to, to overplay that. That's interesting because that, that was one thing that, well, I think you give the reader uh, a, lot of, a lot of leeway and you trust the reader a lot in this book, which is, which is brave uh, considering the subject matter. But I did kind of feel along the way, and this is my own uh, lens that I bring to this, obviously, because it's the racial justice um, dimension of it that really uh, just stands out for me. Um, and I, I just I wanted you to, you know, to I wanted you to, to, to call this what it was. And I wanted you to say what a terrible racial hate crime this was. And of course, you've explained why you don't you don't do this. And, and also you. You complicate the picture because, as you clearly show, also in the podcast, by the way, go and listen to the podcast, it's called Bloodlands, um, is you say this is not just a story about an evil, terrible racial hate crime. Um, and of course, that's right. The danger, however, is that in in the complexity, we lose, we, we, we might lose some moral clarity. And so I think that there was a, a negotiation that I, I could see going on there in the work where on the one hand, you didn't want to just tell a similar story that's always been told. But on the other hand, I wanted I just wanted I wanted more about how evil and racist these these uh, these people were. It's a it's a trial story in some ways. So it's inevitable that the white farmers, the six men on trial, and the trial process focuses on them. Um, it's hard to get away from that. I spent many years uh, making sure that the story of Simon and Samuel and their characters and their life was not ignored in the same way it was in court. Um, and I did my utmost to try and explain that and to, and to stay with Ruth in particular and her story right the way through to the end and not to end a book as I could have done on, well, what happened afterwards to the white farmers? To me, you know, once the verdict came through, you revert back to, um, to the story of, of Ruth and her family. Um, I, I take your point, um, but I, my view is, just again, as a consumer, that if you can't get that anger and that, you know, shocking nature of what happened as it suffuses the entire book, the return to the crime, um, and the way Simon and Samuel were treated in hospital, the way they were misdiagnosed, the way they were, you know, just time after time let down. Um, I don't feel the need to stand on a chair 
and restate what is already so blindingly obvious and what you, as you say, you got from the book. Um, so I, I'm very happy if people are left with that sense of rage and of a rage not fully explored because hopefully that means there's some sort of life beyond the book. You're not tying everything up in a bow and going, there you have it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I can see, I, I concede your point as well. No, it's um, it's it's a read that makes you feel something, and I think that's one of the hardest things to do, to do with literature is to do, is to take the reader from the pages and into some feeling or other, and you certainly go through the the range of emotions when when reading it. Um, I also think it is important to understand the impact on that white farming community, what they were feeling, um, what impact it had on their children. Uh, the suicide attempt and so on. I mean, that's not to somehow let the farmers off. That's for the judge. <laughs> um, mm. It's not to apologize for, excuse their actions, but it is, I think, a much richer tale when the protagonists and the antagonists are rounded human beings. Mm. Mm. Well, um, Andrew, I, I could keep you here all day, but we've already gone over our, our, our allotted time. Um, thank you very much for this important work. Um, I hope that SMWX viewers will head out and buy it. We'll include links to where you can buy it below in the video description. And uh, Andrew, look forward to future work. Anything, anything uh, that you're working on now that, that you'd like to, to talk about? Where to after this? Uh, I'm desperate to write more but i i would be mm. jumping the gun if i said i had something lined up at the moment i'm i'm focused on on my day job uh so i was recently in mozambique uh, i've got a lot of trips planned um as things start to open up or at least um as interest renews uh away from covid stories and to, to all the many other issues you know shaping africa at the moment so yeah a lot of travel planned Absolutely. Well, we'll keep a close eye on that. Also, make sure you check out the podcast associated with this book. And thanks for tuning in to SMWX. Aye.